I just wanted to come in and say good morning, everyone. My name is Casey Schropel. I'm the site head here at Clinton. I've been with Belenco since 2004, and I actually ran environmental quality for almost three years here at this plant site. So I might know some of your faces, but I, I just wanted to come in. I had some time this morning. I just wanted to welcome all of you. We're super excited to be able to host all of you here at, at our site and our facility. If there's anything you need throughout the day, you're in great hands with, with John and my HSC team. But if you do need anything, feel free to reach out. Again, Casey Schroep on and welcome. I hope you have a great day. It's Casey. Yeah. Okay. We cleared you up, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I came the wrong way. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. I know for some people that was a long time. Hopefully, people like Rhonda and Kevin, they actually spent the came out yesterday. It's been, you know, the night before. No, you drove up. <laughs> being an hour behind, and that it was a long drive, wasn't it? So we really appreciate everybody being here at the quarterly meeting and, and really want to thank Lanco for us for hosting this. Uh, you know, it's great. We had one in, in December. We did have one at, at Toyota, uh, material handling. Uh, we've got this one, and uh, Teresa will go over some of it in the agenda. Uh, we did, uh, we have our annual retreat in January of every year. Uh, we didn't do a very good job uh, with the elections of our retreat. Uh, as of February 1st, uh, Teresa has now taken over the executive director's position for the party. Uh, you know, in my tenure, we have been through a lot, you know, through the partners, you know, not only we have to change venues, you know, we've had COVID and, and you know, we've had a lot of new executive committee members come on. We've had some of the you know, people retired, you know, like Steve Leapers and Don Lawson and, and brought a lot of new uh, talent on the board and, and been very blessed to have a, a really good executive committee. Uh, you know, after that tenure, it was time for me to kind of back up and let somebody else take the role. Uh, it's not that I'll be out of it 100%, that I will be an executive committee member. Uh, but going forward, you're going to see Teresa's name on a lot of stuff, and, and you won't see mine. And, and we should have announced that before the agenda, to be honest with you, because if people looked at it and were like, what happened then? <laughs> Uh, I'm, you know, I'm still here. I'm still part of the organization. Did you bring enough clothes for everybody? That was oh, there. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was talking too much. And uh, thank you very much uh, for everybody's support for the organization, you know, over the last 10 plus years. And, and you know, we have our 26th conference. So, you know, we, we've been going for quite some time. Uh, with that being said, I'll turn it over to Teresa, and she's going to do a wonderful job, and, and I hope everybody supports her like they have me over the last 10 years. So, so Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, are they live on Zoom? Yeah. See everybody. Great. Well, welcome everybody. Glad everybody. Uh, made it out. It was a beautiful drive, nice guy. Um, excited about the things that we'll get to talk about today. Uh, really, you know, brand new uh, year, our first quarterly meeting. Um, just getting to talk with a couple of you so far today and hopefully the rest. Um, projects you have going on, this is the best place. Uh, this organization partners um, to find ways to do pollution prevention, um, benchmark, uh, kind of learn and grow with each other. Um, so very, very excited to be here. Um, spend just a few minutes uh, talking through um, some updates. I um, do want to thank John and his group uh, for hosting. Um, it's very exciting about the tour. Um, it's been wonderful so far. This um, bit in uh, very nice. I can do a button. I cannot. No. Oh, the intern works. <laughs> Is it this button? Should be. I'll try it again. Maybe it's not that nice and me. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm going to move because I can't see, see everybody. Okay, so, um, all right. <clears throat> 
That's the world of Zoom and electronics, right? All right. So we do appreciate you guys hosting. Um, this will be a wonderful quarterly and uh, tour. Thank you. Um, so like uh, Ben said, I'm the executive director. I appreciate uh, everybody having faith in me to do this. I'm excited what we're going to get to do in the new changes. Um, assistant director, Ron Rothberg Gerber. Uh, he is uh, not here today, uh, but you will see him uh, a lot, uh, other events and uh, messages from him. And the treasurer, Chris McKenna. Um, the other, the rest of the executive committee, we have a number here and several online. Um, would you mind standing uh, just so we could recognize for a moment? This is the, the team behind the scenes. We all work together uh, between item um, and uh, different members from uh, industry and companies in Indiana uh, to put together the quarterly, the outreach, the conference that we'll get to do in September. Uh, so very, a lot of good work. <clears throat> so currently we have uh, 99 current members. Uh, if you're interested, the exact details on those are our webpage. Uh, you can go to, uh, to see. Uh, we are very interested uh, to grow our membership, have more partners. Um, there's industries we have don't even have on our group uh, yet. So we do have a lot of uh, different industries for that, but uh, looking to have more um, and, and do more outreach. Um, if you're not a member yet, if you've uh, joined today, um, you are welcome to be a member. There, again, the webpage where you can see anybody that stood up, myself, um, and ask for help with that. Um, we'd be happy to show you the way there. Uh, so it's free and it's voluntary. There's no mandate, it's not a regulatory. Um, you just must commit to the partner's uh, pledge to be inducted. Um, and this would be the time in the quarterly where we would talk about inductees uh, for that. Um, you do, however, have to be contingent on good standing. So your compliance record uh, needs to be in good standing. Um, if you have questions on that, uh, you can ask the group or our CTAP members. Uh, we can kind of work through there um, on getting that. Uh, the end goal is to have companies that are members, right? So we're all working together for pollution prevention in Indiana. Um, and then the stipulation other than that is each partner is required to complete um, an annual recertification uh, to retain your membership. So we're very heavy in that annual. Um, it's due here soon in a few weeks. Uh, so hopefully everybody's been uh, working on that so far. Um, so we have uh, some new uh, things for our partnership, trying to do more social media. It's the new way. Uh, so the LinkedIn group, we've had a LinkedIn uh, page. We have a subcommittee that manages that. Uh, please uh, uh, add that if you are on LinkedIn. You can see updates. You can make comments, um, share your stories, uh, whatever works there. Um, and then also we've just started a Twitter. And that is the, um, the information to get to that one too. So that one's a little newer. Um, and would like if uh, you have a moment uh, to add something to either or both of those today, um, if you're able to do that. So you also can help us grow um, and invite your business uh, colleagues. Um, I met a number of uh, new people that said that today's their first time to a quarterly meeting. We're very happy to have you um, and, or other companies that you work with. So um, like if you have a waste provider, you have you know different consultants, um, it's a very good way and we're all like-minded in pollution prevention. And you can also help uh, distributing some of the partners' materials at conferences, um, or um, we have some brochures and things. I think Jean has those at the table out in the front. Um, if you didn't have time to look through those, feel free to do that on break, uh, lunch, or afterward. So we do have our scheduled uh, June uh, Quarterly meeting will be at the Caterpillar Lafayette um, June 21st. Of course, our conference is September 20th. Um, we will have it at the Marriott Keystone again. It's been a very well attended conference, and we'd love to see everybody there. We're still looking in, uh, to have a host for the December quarterly. Um, so, this is another opportunity if your company, if you would like to um, host, uh, we can help do all kinds of setup and things for you. It's 
if it's a good thing to do on a very good benchmarking. So if you think it's a maybe, it doesn't have to be a yes today, a maybe, uh, let me or somebody on the committee know, um, and then we can talk through more details to see if that's a fit. All right, so some more save the dates. Um, so ESP and partners, so um, Environmental Stewardship Program is the ESP. We do partner with um, them as well. Those uh, performance reviews are April 1st. It's not an April Fool's joke. It really is due April 1st. Um, so there, those were delivered. Uh, so if you are one or both or, um, of those members um, to turn those in. Uh, we do use and look at that data um, as some of our um, marketing, some of our information we put together and whatnot. So uh, we do like to use that data for it. So timely is much appreciated. Your partner's member only, um, which is still fantastic. Um, it is due June 1st. So you have a little bit more time um, on that and the same deal we do use that data. <clears throat> So wanted to thanks again. Thank you, Ben. Um, thank you, Alonco, uh, for having us. And um, I appreciate it. You'll see um, this sheet just a few times. We do like to do um, evaluations. Um, it only takes a moment of your time, but it does help us. If there's something you very strongly feel either end of the spectrum, very good. I'd like to see. Um, this will be shown multiple times through the day uh, for the QR code, um, if you wouldn't mind to do that. Appreciate it. I think I'm gonna get right into the presentation. The interviews Lucas Krupp, who is our process engineering manager, and he's gonna give you an overview of basically everything we do here on site. Thanks, John. <laughs> I clear my throat and take a lot of sips of water. I apologize. Um, getting over one of the most recent bugs going around that my kiddo caught in daycare. So, I don't know if anybody else is familiar with that. So uh, I like to start off by asking, has anybody by any chance ever been to our site before and know anything about a language? Got two. Hey, that's better than none. But We'll go into some some high level slides just overall the company and then more specifically into the site, um, which you guys I believe will be going on a tour later today of. Um, and who's taking them on that tour, John? Help me back. Okay, so you guys are splitting it up into two groups. Okay, good. You got two great tour guides then. But so as John said, uh, my name is Lucas Krupp. Um, I'm process engineering manager here on site. Um, a lot of the frontline engineering support staff that troubleshoot the process that I'm going to talk about report to me. I've been with the company about five years. Um, I served as a, a frontline engineer for about three years prior to a couple other roles to then where I'm at now. So um, I'll have questions held until the end. And then I know, I believe you guys said we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So if we want to do questions in between your yeah. presentation and mine, that's fine as well. Um, just if the scope is different of them, I'm, I'm okay with that as well. Um, so getting into it, so Alenco overall, we're an animal pharmaceutical company. Um, so we have a lot of sites all around the world and a lot of different initiatives. So at a high level, but we have our statement of making life better for animal makes life better basically for everyone else around the world as well. That's from multiple aspects. So we work with veterinarians, we work with farmers, we work you know, over the counter, some of our medications you can find at PetSmart or or similar stores. Uh, so that is essentially fighting not only malnutrition to make sure that we can get good protein supply around the world um, on our farm animal side of the business and combat diseases, especially coccidiosis is one of the big ones for us. Um, but also to be able to provide that companionship for mental health uh, for those uh, dogs and cats and, and those kind of animals for whether it's flea and tick to you know, heartworm or whatever other diseases that we're developing and, and trying to prevent. Uh, so we also have not here on our site, we do a, a vaccine side of our business as well um, at some of our other sites domestically and around the globe. Um, those are for a variety of things on the farm animal side, even all the way to aquatic, um, where we do have a vaccine that actually gets injected into salmon at one of our sites out of Canada. So that's just a little tidbit I like to provide because it's a very weird picture um, that I had when I first started here. Wait, you're actually vaccinating fish? Um, 
So again, you won't see that here today, but we do do that at um, one of our sites that's in Canada. So, so specifically here for Elanco Clinton Labs, uh, so we sit on about 640 acres overall. Um, 200 acres of that is actually more established production area where we have development, whereas the rest of that, which I'm sure John will get into, um, is more in terms of the conservation as well as just area that we do not have development on. So we do have about 380 to 400 employees on a, a four shift schedule for our operations staff on the floor. Uh, so four 12 hour shifts that rotate end of the week and will rotate days and nights as well. About 60 buildings overall, and we opened all the way back in 1970. Uh, the facility at its very beginning was designed for penicillin production. Um, that never actually occurred before it got converted. We were a part of Eli Lilly and company up until 2018 uh, when we spun off as our own company. Um, so this site actually up until I think the early 90s was split between human pharma and animal pharma. So in the 90s, that closed down so the penicillin production was no longer active and we converted strictly only to animal health business here. So again, I stated a little bit, we do have different focuses. So we have the food animal side, which you can see, uh, you can see the fish there that I mentioned from one of other sites. We produce products here on site that are used for ruminants, uh, swine, as well as poultry, um, as well as for the companion animals, dogs and cats, especially. Uh, so again, they fit into a lot of different things, including therapeutics, disease prevention, as well as the protein health and just preventing diseases in terms of being able to get that protein health up to allow those flocks and those um, herds to be able to grow appropriately at the pace that we need to feed the world. So specifically name brands, um, most people, unless you're very familiar with farming, probably will not recognize a lot of the stuff on the right. Uh, the right is where we did start here as a company. Um, farm animal was a very heavy focus, whereas just over the recent five years have we really gotten more into the companion animal space here. Um, but the, the ruminants uh, from Ruminants and Coban and Lancoban, those are our products that are more for the ruminants, the cattle, and, and that kind of animal. Whereas uh, Maxiban, Moniban, Hemicell, and Hemicell XT are more of our poultry focused products. And Skysis, Denegard, Thailand, those are more for our swine population that we will produce. On the left here might be items that maybe you recognize a little bit more. Um, you can find these boxes or the cards for these boxes you take up to the counter in PetSmart or, or those stores uh, to buy. So Cherisin is one of our flea and tech medicines that we don't actually necessarily make everything here, um, but we will get some of our API imported in and then we will do the tube filling operation here. Um, we don't actively make any of our ingredients for our companion animal side, but we are the packaging site for those. We either have CMOs or we have other sites around our world that will make the API and then ship those to us. But on the right hand side of the screen for you guys is the farm animal side of the business where we have start to finish between our site and our smaller ancillary site down in Terre Haute, where we start from a, a cell vial and we will actually inoculate and grow that up into a fermenter, recover that material and then finish that material and package it into a bag or a tote bag or whatever appropriate measure for our customer. So again, this is more of just a high level here um, that shows kind of where those products go. So as I mentioned, those remits and Coban and Lancoban trademarks, um, those are going into cattle, some of them into poultry, um, and then down the Naris and API, uh, the Monument and Maximan. So these molecules are what we call ionophores for the most part. Um, so they don't fall into an antibiotic classification uh, because they actually do all of their work inside the gut of the animal and then they're excreted out there. So there is actually no antibiotic interaction like what you would typically find for those claims. In terms of timelines, again, we started here in 1970 and that was actually with our Coban line. Just a couple of years later, we actually doubled that capacity from 16 fermenters up to 32 fermenters overall. Um, and that was to essentially, we, we had a boom in business uh, because it was a very desired product. In the 1980s, we started up that Tylosin process here, followed by right around 1990 of our Narison molecule. Uh, 
Um, then that was kind of our consistent product stream for a while here. And then our R&D uh, pipeline kind of developed close to, you know, 2010 type range there, uh, where we actually brought Hemicell online, um, which is actually an enzymatic activity that couples with some of our products uh, to also help further fight coccidiosis combined with enteris. So we did add two additional fermenters, again, for more capacity, because we continued our product stream growth um, in the mid-2015 timeframe. We are governed by the FDA here, a division of the FDA known as the CVM, the Center for Veterinary Medicine. Um, so we are held to the same standards as other pharmaceutical production. So we have the same kind of regulations that we have to follow in terms of our quality um, that you would find at a full-scale pharmaceutical plant as well. So you can see there's different kind of clauses and areas that those fall under. I'm not going to go into detail on those. Um, but you can see we actually, from start to finish, we ferment our nerissa and menensin molecules, which get finished into the products listed there. We will recover those. You won't actively see that recovery building on your tour today uh, because we actually do recover that material um, with uh, an alcohol that we use below its flash point technically. So there's extra safety precautions to be able to enter that area. Um, and quite frankly, I don't think any of you want to get hit with that smell quite possibly either. Um, and then that will get finished uh, in our in our final building uh, where we'll granulate it and package it in the final, which I'll go into more detail here. We do have for our tilesin molecule, we don't ferment it here. We use a contract manufacturer. And then we actually utilize our small enzyme fermentation facility down in Terre Haute, just about 30 minutes south of here um, for that Hemicell product line, which is more on the enzyme side. So that's core, and you'll, you'll um, walk through this building today, um, which I think gives you an idea of the scale of it, um, is our fermentation process is, it, unless somebody has changed it, I believe we're still the second largest fermentation process domestically outside of Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis. Um, so when I mentioned we have now 34 full-scale fermenters on our plant site, each of those final fermenters, um, which is the final step there, is about 200,000 liters each, so about 50,000 gallons each. So where we start that process is it actually comes, we have a state-of-the-art cell bank in Indianapolis called Building 82. Uh, we have uh, research and development folks that will do uh, classical mutations on those strains to improve productivity from what we can get out of a fermenter. We will actually inoculate those into a shaker flask in a quality control lab. And then we will take what we lovingly call a bazooka, uh, which is just a sterile transfer tank, a uh, small one to take that shaker flask culture and move it out to our production floor into a bunk tank, which is about a tenth of the size of our full fermenter, so only about 5,000 gallons. And then once that grows and we monitor it for sterility and potency and the correct amount of growth, we'll then transfer that into our full vessel and monitor the slew of critical parameters to ensure that we're, uh, we're growing the proper way and excreting everything the way that we need to excrete. Then we'll step over into our recovery process. Um, so we'll harvest that material and then we'll actually stop that cell growth process with that alcohol I mentioned of why we can't enter this area today on your tour. Uh, so we'll stop that cell growth process and then we'll recover that material. Well, that broth that's being put into our recovery process is about 80% water. But well, we can't do anything with that. So we have to send it through an evaporator first. After we evaporate the majority of the moisture off, it's going to be our crude intermediate. And we'll actually send it through a centrifuge. And yet Drew has a, one of the things that we lovingly call a bazooka right there. So, uh, so we'll actually transfer that uh, into our centrifuge area. And so that broth, which I'll pass around here, um, that's coming out of our fermentation process will look more like this. So it's pretty much. 80% water. There's a lot of solids in here, but for right now, they're still pretty much dissolved or just really not visible and kind of a slurry. So then once we send it through the centrifuge and we recover the stream that we want, uh, we'll send it into a mixer and combine it with uh, a diluent. And that diluent will essentially change it. So then this will be more of the product that looks like what we're getting out of it after we send it through our dryer step. And we send it to the dryer step so we can make sure we evaporate off any other moisture we need while making sure our product is the right potency. 
Then we will change from doing more of a pumping mechanism and we'll actually start pneumatically conveying. So now we get into more of our dust collection systems and moving, moving particulate uh, just via vacuum. And that will come over to our final granulation and finishing area uh, where we'll have some storage silos initially, but then we'll actually do what's a little bit backwards for uh, some people that are familiar with feed mills and, and that kind of uh, mode of action is we'll actually take that powder that I just showed, that Menensen dryer powder, and we're actually going to compress it into a pellet. So we compress it into a pellet for a couple of reasons, and that's so we can make sure we have a homogeneous grind uh, afterwards so we can particle size it and we can forward process it to get accurate dosing as well as making sure that we have the least amount of airborne particles to our final customers. But we'll take those pellets and then we'll recrush them. So typically your pellet mill in terms of the feed mill industry, which a lot of our customers are familiar with, is the final step because then once you get it into a pellet form, sometimes those pellets are even sent out for the feed in certain scenarios as opposed to crushing them again. We'll send them through a series of crushing and then screener steps. And we try to minimize any waste streams that we have. So the majority of the spots on our plant site, we have recycle loops. So if we have a crush that gives us an overs particle that's too big to forward process or something that's too small and too fine, we actually have ways to reconstitute that back into the process instead of having to throw it away as waste. Then it will go to one of two areas, depending on your product for final formulation and final blending. And again, that's more for homogeneity sake to make sure the product is safe, uh, both from a dosing perspective, as well from a particulate perspective, before it will then be finished. So it will then be combined uh, to get dosed down to the correct potency uh, by mixing with whatever diluents that uh, we need or whatever the customer has in terms of the specs. And then we'll send that through a mixer, a final screener, and then we'll actually bag out the majority of our products in a 25 kilogram bag, um, which when they're leaving our site, they're actually considered a type A medicated article. Um, typically before it's fed to the animal, it's diluted all the way down to a type C medicated article. So the interesting tidbit I like to give here is whenever you look at a 25 kilogram bag that you guys will see out there on a tour in one of our buildings, a sugar packet size is about what a single cow needs in a day or for every single time they feed. So when you see the sheer volume out there, it gives you a scale of just how large of an impact and how many head of cattle that we're actually able to feed and improve that protein source for the world. Our, our other product, not in this same mainstream, but I mentioned we have a contract manufacturer do, uh, the tiles and process, we get that liquid API in from them, and then we'll actually combine it and extrude almost like a noodle type consistency before we will grind that down and then send that out for finishing at another contract manufacturer. Again, that's one of our products for swine. You'll be able to see this process today, but it'll just be from a very high level kind of in passing. Um, it's one of them that based on the, the safety of the process and the product. Um, doesn't actually have to be inside of a closed room itself. Um, it has enough mitigation efforts involved that, that is not needed. On our other end, we have our hemicell process. So this is getting into more of our enzyme activity. It's a little bit different. It's more of a spray drying application. So we will ferment this material down at our small Terre Haute site, as I mentioned. And we'll actually take our liquid API from that, which again, will look more this consistency. And we will actually take this and we will spray dry it onto a carrier molecule. So whether that's a flower, whether that's a corn cob, whatever it may be, we'll spray that on and they'll end up looking more of like a, almost like a flower type consistency. That material goes through a blender and then into a storage tank where again, it's bagged out, but on this end of the plant, it's actually in smaller bags that are 10 kilograms. On our companion animal, which I won't go, I won't go into a full breakdown of the slide because, as, as I said, we more just do the packaging here. Uh, but it is new to us, starting up in 2018. Um, you can see our list. It is also the special highlight is that that Cheriston box I mentioned. That's actually governed by the EPA because it falls more 
into instead of a pharmaceutical falls more into a pesticidal category. <laughs> we'll do the tube filling and the blistering here. Um, and then we will actually carton case packets and send that out to affiliates from here as well. But the special um, focus here is one of our sites that's actually over at Hunang, France, are the ones that make the API of the, the dog chewable tablets that then they will send those to us to do the packaging operation. One of the things we pride ourselves on here um, is that consistency in particle sizing. Um, not only is it even dispersion in the final feed and the homogeneity through the batch, but I mentioned the, the accurate dosing and the airborne particles. By having a consistent sizing, one other benefit you get is you actually reduce carryover from batch to batch because you have left places for pieces of different sizes to get hung up in different equipment. We do have, with being governed by the FDA, release specs that we have to follow. Um, so we have a motto here, it's safety first, quality always. So on the quality always front, we actually have really wide guidelines per regulatory, so they, they look wide. Um, for what our release specs are, we actually set up our own internal Olenco release specs, which are inside of those. So we make a commitment to release at even a tighter set of regulations. And then where we actually will control our process to for our critical parameters, we actually have separate alert limits set up so we can keep our process under control consistently all the time. We have a very large quality control lab, as you can imagine here, um, with all the production uh, that I've mentioned. So we actually run up to about 10,000 assays per month and have a 24 seven quality control lab staff with multiple different labs. Um, you should see a brief part of that on your tour today uh, from a window shopping perspective, since it does require some extra badging to get in. Um, but just, just for a high level, just in the raw materials that come in to make sure we've got good raw materials going into our product, that's about a thousand assays per month. Whereas when we talk about our actual product testing, it's closer to almost 9,500 on its own. <laughs> Again, I mentioned a lot of this kind of already in terms of GMP guidelines. Um, so obviously we're very controlled by procedures here as well as standard work practices, uh, batch tickets, um, you know, going through all the quality processes and monitoring of your parameters to ensure we have a good safe product going out. And I'm not going to regurgitate the same information because I talked on one slide on it. So that is all I've got. So I'm fine opening up the questions unless <laughs> if anybody's got any burning questions, feel free or would like any elaboration or anything. Yes, you mentioned uh, some sort of malady tox something that you focused on. I can't remember the word. Can you tell me about it? Toxio. Oh, so, coccidiosis. Yeah. So coccidiosis, um, most people, the most familiar uh, are going to be in the poultry industry. Um, so it's actually, uh, it comes from fecal matter. Um, so chickens, when you're in a flock, right, there's going to be some fecal matter introduction. And when you have more, there's more of a chance of that happening. So what happens is there's actually, uh, when they ingest some of those particles, how they can manifest is you can get some sporocytes that generate from that, which then will actually invade the cells of the intestinal wall uh, of the chicken, and it will start to rupture those cells and spread, which then basically allows them not to be able to process nutrition and can cause things like diarrhea or other, other kinds of, you know, just medical hazards that don't allow them to gain weight. Um, so that product, what it actually does is it will it will fight and it will cause those molecules that they're ingesting that whenever they're there, it will cause those spore sites to actually rupture and not allow them to reproduce. Um, and it does that. Um, there, there's a video on it that uh, is not in this presentation, but if you're interested in the science behind it, um, I'm sure I can have I can have John send it over. I enjoy it because I'm a, a nerd at heart, but uh, it, it essentially causes an imbalance of sodium and like potassium molecules across membranes that causes an influx of water that causes the, the cell to eruption. So, and that's the mode of action for a lot of the ionophore. And also I mentioned they're not considered antibiotics because that's all happening in the gut and intestine kind of lining. So it's not anywhere else in the body. It stays 
only local there, and then it's excreted naturally anyway. So, any other questions? Yes, sort of a two part question, but it's around evaporation. So, I'm assuming you use a lot of water. Yes. Um, can you give an idea of how much water you use? John can probably estimate that good, yeah, pretty well. A billion, it's a little bit more than a billion gallons a year. So, um, about Pretty much 1,900 gallons a minute. And then the second part of that question is since you're evaporating it, what's, what's your means of evaporation? How do you do it? So we can go into it, but um, actually, of that 1,900 gallons a minute, a fairly small amount of that is actually going in the product. It is a raw material. I mean, we do actually add water to the fermenters, um, but most of our water. Usage is for cooling tower makeup, um, boiler makeup, and we have we have our own um, drinking water system here on the site. So also for domestic uses, um, yeah. So if you want to talk about the evaporation and your recovery, yeah. I mean, it's just it it's just heat based with with steam well, water running steam. through it, right? Yeah. Um, and the the other interesting, which I didn't highlight on the on the the site overview is so the site was originally selected due to the rail system the proximity to the road as well as we're over a very large aquifer um so we don't actually pump any water into our site so all that billion gallons we use we actually draw up um so that that stat i didn't know for actually the first couple of years i worked here um and i was i was very very impressed whenever i learned that um so Outside of that, we also have um, so like for some of the material that comes off like in the recovery and our final finishing steps, um, especially with pneumatic transfer involved and that that alcohol I mentioned that we do stop the fermentation process with during our recovery. Um, we do have carbon absorbers um, that we send that that gas stream through to scrub out any of those volatile materials that need to come out, um, which I know. John can speak to a lot more from the environmental perspective of it, but um, we have several of those on site um, for that purpose too, to be able to process those kind of off gas streams of those, you know, what do you do with some of the emissions, right? So, yeah. So back to the water, um, how much of that 1900 gallons of rain ends up in the river? What, what kind of percentage is that? Yeah. Um, about three quarters, roughly. Yeah. So our our daily discharge here is about a million and a half gallons a day. And I don't know if you do the math. I think I think nineteen hundred gallons a minute gets you to about two million three hundred thousand, roughly. So. And on that discharge, we have. Several several checkpoints of the oh, yeah. street. Yeah, right? we do have a we we got a uh, permit for the state for uh, an FS permit, a national pollution or <laughs> the pollution filter discharge elimination. Plus plus uh, and besides that, uh, we do actually operate an internal wastewater treatment plant for our community. And and some of the tarp problems here. So the question about the evaporation, the bottoms off of that that contain water, um, are actually processed by our wastewater treatment plant. You try to recycle any of your water at all, or is it, oh, that's not worth it. <laughs> um, we're working on something right now. Uh, in this sort of question, the the. Um, uh, Office water quality. No, <laughs> it's fun to bring that up. We, the purity of our wastewater treatment plant water, because of its so um, membrane filtration, bioreactor and membrane filtration, and the dissolved solids in it are actually lower than the dissolved solids in the well water we pull in. And so we're looking to use that at a cooling tower. And we're pretty close to getting that done. Run into some hurdles for for control. Yeah, it's probably one of the next problems. 
and then there's a whole bunch of other complexities. I mean, a lot of things that used to be on one one through fluid water, like straight well water on the ground, it could be reheated by trees to become a fluid power instead. So we're recycling that water through the tower. And we are returning a lot more steam condensate than we ever have in the past. And a lot of that was just, you know, pretty easy just to dump it and bother. So we put the condensate clutch and stuff back, back in service. And, and we're recovering the water and the heat also. So we're just going to use it. We do have one question from an online participant. How do these products affect manure composition quality from treated animals? And do they present concerns for surface water pollution via runoff? I'll have to defer to John on that one, or we'll have to defer to one of our, our sales reps and get an answer back to you guys on that front. Because once it leaves the site is where it leaves my, my knowledge on that front. So I, I won't speak to something I don't know, but John, John may have more info. Yeah, I can that. speak to it a little bit. So for the outdoors themselves, um, We do break down in nature. Um, one other one other waste stream that our that our wastewater treatment site takes the, because of the nature of all these fermenters and and ferment a batch and in between each batch we have to have um, so batch to batch what's the word I'm looking for it's, well there's oh the turnaround yeah the turnaround but yeah. there's sterility in between yeah. the batches yep yeah. so you're not allowed you're not allowed to use the same piece of equipment and leave it contaminated with the previous batch. So it's got to be completely clean and sterilized. So we do generate a fair amount of wastewater from that process because that each of these fermenters, which are fairly large, have to be completely cleaned out on the inside and then sterilized with a caustic soda solution. Um, we have a permit from IDEM to actually land upon all those wastewaters because some of the residual that's in the fermenter has um, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus in it, which is you know, brick fertilizer. <laughs> So we have pretty extensively studied the encore de de degradation in the ground around our own, you know, our own plant on the farm field to apply it up. And we understand that. Um, feedlots, obviously there are other issues if, if they become very large. Um, a lot of those have, you know, it's pretty much on a state to state basis to regulate that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> What I will mention on that is not specific on those products, but I think John will get into it. We do have some products that are are pushing for the sustainability efforts. They're more on that enzyme side of the business in terms of reducing emissions. But I'm not gonna not gonna steal his thunder because I saw one of his slides had it on there. So I believe there was one more question at one point. Actually, you answered it. I okay. was gonna ask a question about the water. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? No, thanks for all your time for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to concentrate on some of our green initiatives and sustainability efforts over the last few years. Here we go. Back on. So, um, as Lucas was saying, about 52 year history here since 1970. And a lot of our sustainability efforts, really, in those last 52 years, have been collaborative right. efforts um, you know, between us and and some of it's uh, IDEM and some of it's, uh, it's on the county level, Indiana DNR 
and uh, and partners, obviously, the ESP. So with ESP, um, we were actually one of the charter members of ESP in 2007. Um, and of course, I, I know this is partners, but a lot of you are also ESP members. But of course, ESP recognizes um, Indiana regula regulated entities for going above and beyond um, current regulations. Mm -hmm. Some of our key accomplishments since 2007 um, documented almost 30,000 megawatt reduction in electrical uh, demand, uh, 5,000 pounds per year reduction in phosphorus discharge, and uh, um, 3,000 pounds per year reduction in refrigerant losses that we've um, put programs in to be tighter on our, our chillers. And so here's that question about water. Um, so our site, as, um, as recent as 2008, was actually using about 2.3 billion gallons of water a year. And we've made some pretty significant reductions since then. Um, that 2.3 billion is actually over 4,000 gallons a minute, if you do the math. And so we've, we've reduced from 4,000 gallons a minute down to about 1,900 gallons a minute. You can kind of see our progress there at the bottom of this chart. And I don't think I have a slide that goes specifically into this. I think I gave a presentation a couple of years ago at a partners meeting um, about some of those initiatives. And a lot of that has been things like uh, better process control and cooling towers, uh, where we're tightening, we're, we're tightening up on the chemistry control. So we we can cycle the towers up more. So we're using less chemical, which is good. Plus we're also um, blowing down less water. So you kind of get both benefits there. Um, some of the things I was talking about, the condensate return, some of these systems that we took off of once, once through well water cooling and put on a cooling tower. So that water was going through a heat exchanger once and then being discharged, you know, basically directly to storm sewers, non-contact water. But now we put in our cooling tower, so we're not having to have that flow through that piece of equipment. So a lot of things like that. Um, also, some significant partnerships with DNR. Um, I think the next slide you'll see this, but we did a floodplain restoration project um, in the late 2000s, and there's a wetlands area just east of the site between us and the, and the Wabash River. Um, that some of that property was actually deeded over to the Healthy Rivers Initiative in 2011, uh, 308 acres. And we continued to farm part of that, but a large part of that was actually a wetland restoration area. And there's a 50 trees display in part of that area. And then we've also done some other plantings. And as recent as 2020, we had a couple guys out here from uh, DNR looking for this little frog here, this uh, plains leopard frog, which was an endangered species, which they were able to find some, which is pretty interesting. Uh, if you ever go out with those guys, it's, it's pretty fun because they do most of their work at night after dark. <laughs> so here they are crawling around in this wetlands with hip waders on and, and flashlights. And they can actually, um, they're pretty good at picking out the different sounds of all the different frogs. And, you know, they can tell you, oh, that's a point, you know, that's this kind of frog or that's this sort of frog. Um, and then when they heard, when they heard one chirping or whatever the technical term is for whatever frog name is, that is <laughs> then they, they'll get up close to it and then they'll kind of get the spotlights out and they'll start looking for it. And they're looking for like photographic evidence that this isn't a picture of a, an actual frog we found here, but, but they did actually find some, some frogs. So this is the, an overview of the site, and this, this kind of shows you the area that's in the Healthy Rivers that's east of us. Um, and, and by the way, here with the, uh, with the river being up like it is, uh, a good portion of that's actually flooded right now. But the water will recede, and by summer we should be able to put a crop in there. So we also um, partnered quite a bit, like I was talking about, you know, floods and things like that with uh, Vermillion County. And we're pretty active on their soil, soil and water conservation district um, as far as trying to attend the meetings. And of course, whenever you apply for um, construction permits under stormwater plan, you have, you have to work with your local uh, water conservation district to, to get those 
reviewed, which which we've gone through that a couple couple times in some of our projects. Partners, obviously, um, you guys all know what that's about. So we were actually formerly a member, technically through Lilly, <laughs> through 2018, and then um, actually just in June of 2021 joined as our own site. Other initiatives. So um, I don't know if you noticed when you pulled into the parking lot that some of you might be able to see through the windows. There's kind of a strip along the highway that looks a little brown. Well, this is actually a, a native tree and prairie habitat that we've reestablished. And um, this is one of those water saving things also. We were watering all that grass. And um, so we don't have to water it anymore because we planted things there that is there are pretty much drought resistant and, and the trees kind of take care of themselves. Uh, we actually hired a company out of Indianapolis can't remember the name of the company. Now. Do you remember those? Cardinal. Yeah, Cardinal. Card Cardinal. Cardinal. Yes, I think they changed their name, but if you do a search on Cardinal, they hooked them up. And so they're they they're a professional. Um, I think they have quite a few different aspects of their business. One of the things that they do is they will come in and help you put in an area like this if you're interested. Um, you know, they make all the recommendations on how to prepare the area. And then they'll professionally source the seeds, bring your own people out, plant all that stuff for you. And then if you enter into the right contractual uh, agreement with them, they'll actually help you maintain this too, because it's kind of hard to keep one of these things going. So three or four years, they'll come out and try to they'll do some um, invasive species removal and that sort of thing for you. But this is the area I'm talking about. It's that whole strip. So it's just a little bit more than three and a half acres. And when you do the math, I mean, we didn't have flow meters. We didn't have a flow meter on the sprinkler system to that, but we do have a professional lawn service that, that helps us with keeping the grass cut. And they also oversee all the sprinkler systems. And, and I know that they were following this kind of two inches per week kind of guideline just to keep the grass looking good. And you start figuring out how much, you know, two inches of water per week ends up being during the growing season. And it's, it's well over 5 million gallons a year. So, and this is a series of photographs. It looked a little rough when it first started, but it does green up pretty nice in the summer. And actually, if you look at that last photo, what's interesting is the prairie area is actually greener than the highway strip, you know, on the other side of the highway fence. So, I think this is my last slide, but just is some other, just an overview of some other green initiatives. Um, we do have an active beekeeping club on site, and I think there are three hives. Yeah, I think there's three hives. I'm not sure. COVID kind of messed some of that stuff up. Yeah, I don't know what the status. Of I don't know either. There, there were three hives the last time I knew. Yeah. yeah, and and a couple a couple seasons when when they were active and they were really being taken care of well. I know that they did generate some honey and we did sell that honey and donate that to a local food pantry or something like that. It wasn't enough to provide everybody on site with honey, but you know, anyway, um, we do have plant site, plant site recycling. So it's a single waste stream type model. There's actually um, two dumpsters, one's internal for our own break rooms and the, the cafeteria. And there's actually one that has public access it's out in the parking lot. You guys probably drove right by it on the way in. So we open that up to anybody in Vermillion County if they want to come in and drop off recycles, they can do that there. Um, we do have a butterfly sanctuary, um, which is basically just some uh, wildflowers in the little cluster that sort of attract butterflies. It's not um, certified or anything like that yet, but we might might try to do that in the future. There are some bat houses and duck houses in the river bottoms. Um, one of the things that Lucas was talking about was our packaging of the companion animal products. And we, we've tried to make a lot of strides here recently to incorporate more recyclable type materials in the actual packaging. I don't know, do you have a thing on that? Or? I, I don't have specifics on it, but I know we have a couple of packaging engineers on site too. They report not to me, but through my same organization. Um, where we've looked at um, whether it's different types of paper to different types of 
uh, stretch wrap or other material just to get after some of that green initiative. Sometimes even is there a way we can go to, you know, a thinner plastic or can we stretch wrap a pallet six times instead of eight times and still have it free of product damage during shipment to our customers. So there are initiatives like that that have, that have been looked into and are actively looked into by our packaging folks. Okay. And then the last thing, which Lucas sort of alluded to, we do actually have some products at Elanco that are sort of targeting greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so Xperior, which is one of the products that we, we package in C1, is targeting uh, ammonia emissions. And then this Bovera product is actually brand new, and it's a um, it's a collaborative effort with uh, DSM. And so Elanco has the exclusive marketing distribution rights in the United States. I believe the product's already being manufactured in Europe, and we're currently looking for a site to put a facility to manufacture that. So, you know, fingers crossed it ends up here. We're not still very, we're not sure really at this point where it's going to end up. Probably someplace in Indiana is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I think it's for sure somewhere in Indiana, <laughs> at least from what that seems to be the, yeah. the generally but, accepted thing. But yes, uh, the partnership with BSM, the actual facility that they produce for Europe is located in Ireland. And so Bovera actually targets uh, methane emissions. So going after ammonia and methane, which are two of the big, you know, cattle. If you're wondering, yeah, I was going to say, if you're wondering where those come from, it is the emissions from both ends of the cattle. <laughs> yeah. So any questions about sustainability sort of things? Yes. You know, I've had how much energy we use in Europe. So I, I can tell you we're fairly typically 30 to 40 megawatts per hour. Sounds about right. Right. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know the recent stat. Yeah. So another way of putting that perspective is the electric power demand of Terre Haute, Indiana is about 35 megawatts, believe it or not. Yeah. So we're on par with that. Um, definitely top 10 Indiana electrical demand, um, you know, right up there with some of the, um, some of the steel mini mills, it's for that sort of thing. And, uh, I wonder, you would think of, um, well, it used to be Alcoa, but whoever it is now in, in, uh, Lafayette, the aluminum plant there. I would think that they would have a fairly large electrical demand also. But anyway, it, it is fairly, fairly large. <laughs> yeah. So and how many employees work here during the regular day shift? So we've got in terms of employees as a whole, we've got about 400, um, 400 or so. So when you think about the split between you're you're talking normally about 100 people, a length of employees specific that are like here for like 12 hour shifts so like in terms of like a rotation but you'll it'll seem like a lot more than that um so i'd probably say probably between probably close to 150 to 200 because we do have contractors and subcontractors that are on site as well from pipe fitters to welders to electricians and, and all that yeah there's an odd split too between some of the support staff pretty much or Monday through Friday days kind of people. So a lot of the engineering staff is generally on days, a lot of the HSE staff, you know, some of that. So it does kind of skew the number a little bit heavy <clears throat> on days, but. I would say operations core, the people running the plant, I would probably say you've probably got about a hundred on shift at a time. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing a rough total in my head. Right about right. So a little bit less on night shift, right? Cause you're gonna run with a little bit less of a crew cause you're, your big change, your support staff aren't necessarily going to be there, right? So you don't have as much interaction that's needed on that front. So. And finally, how many HSC folks do you have? Six. Oh, yeah, okay. I guess, right, right. I wasn't, I wasn't including all the health and safety folks I was thinking about. Um, yeah, about roughly eight or nine. It there's so there's a couple of our a couple of our people are sort of um, split between this site and Terre Haute, kind of half time. Um, 
but we have one that's about to retire who is kind of went out the corporate. So, yeah. We have, I, I mentioned that, the, you know, our modern safety first quality always. So, one of the things we do is so with operations as well as combined with what we call profit needs. So, that'd be more of the, the support staff, right? We do have in all of our operations areas as well as a lot of our functional areas on a regular monthly cadence. Uh, department safety teams uh, yeah. where topics are brought in representatives attend and you work through problem solving and updates and focusing on topics of the month or you know prevention of something that you see coming up um so it's not just a responsibility of just the hsd group we've actually got it spread very well throughout the board the smaller hsd group is more just you know the main points of Main so, points of contact and really driving some yeah. of those bigger efforts through, right? Sub subject matter experts and, and reporting. So, doing actual reporting or that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm not even including you know, the departmental safety teams. Probably each of the major departments has at least one full time member and probably two people supporting them on shifts, or maybe one per shift, depending upon how big your organization is. So, you have a few more. Yeah. Typically, the, the one I attended as a frontline engineer, now I, I was in one of the buildings that had a little more manual interaction, so we had a little bit higher as an operations for staff. But our typical department safety team meeting that we have monthly had 10 to 15 attendees regularly total. So, yeah. Good involvement. Okay, does the plant not site recycling? Does that include like the packaging materials that have come in with the uh, materials coming in and out of the facility? Is that, is that kind of stuff? How is that treated? So as much as we can. So if it, if it's coming in like in a cardboard box or whatever, those yeah. are broken down. Um, some of the some of the incoming packaging that actually is shrink wrap, we're able to recycle the shrink wrap on it too. So our site's so large, um, and you'll notice on on the tour, a lot of our materials come into rail cars. So you know that's comes in a rail car, rail car leaves empty. Um, there's also a lot that comes in in, in truck form. Tanker trucks, you know, which um, some of our, yeah, we'll, we'll try and do so. Like some of our raw materials that will come in, they'll come in their own type of packaging. So we'll try to recycle or, you know, responsibly, you know, dispose of what we can. But a lot of those materials, the containers that come in because they are contaminated with that product um, due to the safety from that product is similar. Typically, don't qualify for some of those recycling initiatives all the time. Where we can, we will, like, you know, use pallets and, and all that, right? But, like, if we're talking about, say, a bag of an API we get in from a contract manufacturer, we typically still have to dispose that bag because it is contaminated with that product. And there's no way to scrub that material off of there because it just it was shipped overseas to us. So there's there's no way to clean those ones, but where we can do. Now, what we do, what we will do, though, is generally like like the, the dog chews, that sort of thing. So that's coming in bulk packed in a, in a plastic bag that's over wrapped in a either a, a plastic or a steel bucket. And those buckets can be either recycled or reused. We, we do try to do that. So, yes. Did you say that your recycling is open to the public? Yes. But the uh, the dumpster that's out in the parking lot, the public does have access to that. Does the city or county help you with the collection and processing of that? No, we we bear all that cost ourselves, right? Yes. Do you have any published sustainability goals for like the five to ten year um, outlook? Um, so Lakewood does have a website, and there is a sustainability section on that. I honestly have not looked at it for a while. I, I know that there are some basic sustainability goals, and the corporation within the last couple of years has hired a um, a sustainability manager, and there are he does have staff, so there are people involved with that effort now. There, there is a whole segment. I, I'm not going to get into the detail because I don't know if I can regurgitate them accurately, but we do actually have um, an engineering like focused project on like green energy initiatives as well. Um, for this site, but also for the broader organization too, um, for more of a central standpoint. But I'm sure either John or I could find the the, the link to where you could get the official statements. But right. I don't know them off the top of my head. So yes, 
So back to your public recycling bin out here, a, a lot of those kind of facilities have been plagued with drop off of stuff that you shouldn't be dropping off there. So I wonder how bad that was, how you deal with that, or maybe you've got to figure out a way to keep that in the background. Well, Patrick's here. Actually, ours has been pretty good, but yeah, yeah. we haven't had any major. Yeah. Nobody's yeah. dropping mattresses. Security. Yeah. So far, we've we've done this here. Yeah. Maybe that's the answer. We gotta have video taping of everybody that doesn't drop taking off. And there are cameras in the parking lot, so you know. Um, yeah, our biggest, I think our biggest thing has been actually kind of internal miscommunications between us and our, our waste vendor um, about expectations. And initially, they got a list of the stuff it's like, okay, you can plastics, you know, steel, aluminum cans, glass, all these other things. But glass actually fell off the list and we weren't, we didn't, we weren't told. So then they were getting, the, you know, the mix, mix uh, stream in with the glass mixed in. And kind of got some feedback from them on that. So it's an interesting, you just got to make sure you have your, you know, agreement spelled out. But obviously, they don't expect to have TVs in there and mattresses and just <laughs> bags of garbage. It, ours is pretty well, the signage on it, probably more signage than you'll ever see one. It's generally out in public. Um, it's pretty specific about nothing can go in here if it's in a bag. You know, that's one of the big things. If, if they get a bag of something and they don't know what it is, it's going to go in the trash because they're not going to take the safety risk of opening that bag to see what you threw out and try to sort through something like that. So, yes. So, so where does it go? Does it go into the Republic sorter? Or? Yes. Yes. We, we use Republic and then it goes like public to their building. And I've been there and, yeah. and plastic bags are like the worst thing that you can send them. Yeah. Yes. That, 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 yeah. I don't think people, I mean, the, the things are doing good because of the fact that even said it's like a bag, but because it is a single screen cycle and the equipment that they use over there, it gets all wound up and all the way. So that, that's the one thing that describes the threat is. No bag above it. No, we can't have a bag. Yeah. Now, in the beginning, there was some North America type stuff, but yeah, having bigger, bigger issues. Yeah, and obviously, we can control that a lot better inside the site because with our own clean staff, and you know, it, it's easy to train 20 people, much easier than try to you know, train a whole county of people that's dropping things off, whatever, you know. Yeah, there's a, a lot of a lot of wish cycle that goes on that you know, just causes a nightmare at that site. You can just get people to follow the rules of recycling and work a lot better. Um, so I, I think Lee just slipped out. The the question again about um electrical power demand, and, and you'll get a feel for this when we go out on the tour. Each of those 34 fermenters that Lucas was talking about. Each one of those, so our, our fermenters are, are sitting horizontally. And, and basically, you think about a big 50,000 gallon horizontal tank, and, and you're trying to throw this microorganism in there and make sure that every bit of that microorganism has equal opportunity to get the oxygen it needs and the nutrients it needs and keep all this stuff homogeneous and everything else that's going on. Well, there, there's two. There's two mixtures basically on each one of those. And what's the force power on those motors? Uh, if I remember correctly, there's somewhere in the range of like 500 to 700 horsepower each, each motor. Yeah. So mm -hmm. figure just say 500. It's so two 500, pow, 500 horsepower <laughs> motors sitting on each of those 34 fermenters running 24 7. You know, and then there are some, there is some downtime between cycles. We try to keep, we try to keep them pretty much full all the time. You know, so we harvest a batch and within a couple of days it's reset and go again. So besides all that, then you're uh, you're pumping an enormous amount of air into this. So you have all these air compressors running, pumping air in because it is a living microorganism that needs oxygen. 
Um, you're also trying to control the temperature of these tanks. So you're dumping copious amounts of chilled water over the outside of the tank to try to keep it cool. And it doesn't matter, middle of winter, you're still using probably 75% of what you use in the middle of summer. So still a huge amount, yes. Have you looked at any type of green power production on your site? Well, that's part of the it's part of the problem though. You're talking about such a huge, you know, our our best bet's probably gonna be buying credits or trying to divert some of our energy from like north of us where there are you know wind turbines and that sort of thing. About the best work. They, they have they have looked at it and it is an ongoing thing that they do a review. I mentioned some of those green energy initiatives from the engineering aspect. So some of that has even been looking at, you know, a solar field or something that we could pull from. But regardless of what we do on the green energy based on the power consumption that we have, it could take a small fraction. So then it's then it's doing the the you know the, the true cost estimation on whether or not that's truly going to benefit anybody from just even the amount of work that could go into it. So, yeah. But it is ongoing. Like I said, there's some, there's some central resources that, that do look at those green initiatives. I believe our heel site over in Germany that we acquired with Bayer Animal Health actually uses a substantial amount of green energy. Um, they're primarily more focused. They do a lot of Packaging, so like the Advantage Two that you'll find on shelves that have Bayer logo on them. That's actually inside of our product wheelhouse too. But they do a lot of that over there. But I think they have a big green energy um, share. I, I remember seeing something coming out on that soon after we acquired them, which was good to see. Yeah, Germany and their local community drive a lot of that too, though. And um, it's just part of their. Yes, I'm assuming that your boilers are natural gas. Uh, yes. So how much natural gas do you have? Um, no, I don't know offhand. I can tell you, um, on average, we're generating about 120,000 pounds of steam at about 175 pounds, roughly. So it's 175 pounds saturated steam, lots of steam, 120,000 pounds an hour. So we um, didn't put this. That's a pretty good estimate. <laughs> so our um, our primary steam generation on the site up to about five years ago was actually full fire boiler, which under Lily we shut down boiler and and then actually um, it's. Been completely demolished now, so there's no chance of bringing that back. But that was a pulverized coal. For, for how? Oh, for what's the time frame on that? Okay. How much? I'm sorry. What year is that? 1.2 million decatherms. 1.2 million decatherms? Billion, billion or million? Million. Million. That does make sense to I me. Mean, we're we're at 140 uh, saturated uh, what steam? Yeah. <laughs> that you're about double our capacity. So I I basically double what we're doing. But your life is one higher than that. Uh, but then it makes sense because you're probably losing a lot of energy because of the <clears throat> size of your facility. Yeah, so that's another fortunate thing. So in between each batch, each of those furnaces has to be steam sterilized also. So you're, you're cleaning with water first, steam sterilizing, and then chemically sterilizing as well. And again, steam's in a, it's in con contact with products. You can't, you can't recycle that. You can't, can't return that as compensated. It isn't going out as land application. You have, a, you have a central powerhouse for your boilers. I'm assuming you probably have a series of boilers. There's four. Yeah, yeah, it's not on the tour, but there's there's four boilers. Yes. Um, are these other green initiatives? Are these current year or ongoing, or can you so share details of this year's? These are all ongoing. Um, I'd say that the closest one to being a this year thing is with Bobear, depending upon where that ends up. I mean, obviously, you know, Atlanta's working towards manufacturing at some place. More currently, still working on water savings, continue to do that. We're actually working on 
um, further phosphorus discharge. Some of that's permit driven. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's got a new limit now on phosphorus emissions to um, surface waters. So ours, ours is now some one, mil one milligram per liter, basically. Yeah. Um, we were pretty close to that anyway, but that's that's actually even caused us to be more diligent about our cooling, cooling tower chemistry control, basically, because that's where most of our phosphorus is entering. Um, yes. The land application, is that just on site on your 600 acre? Yes. Yes, it is on our, only on our own site. That's another one of those things that's um, it's sort of on con in conflict with the whole green energy. Yeah, we could put in a 400 acre solar field probably, um, but problem is I need that land. I need that land to land apply on so I can farm it, you know? And if, if I take that waste off site and incinerate it, and you know, we've been through that already and trying to run that through wastewater treatment is, you know, basically you're building a wastewater plant the size of Terre Haute's again. Yeah. which we don't need always for a treatment plant that size when we can just put this out and actually use it for its beneficial nutrient value you know so that's it's one of those things that you know they, they can play sometimes uh we even we we tried floating the idea of wind turbines on our own site doesn't make much sense on the top so we looked at the river bottoms well our conservation easement for healthy rivers initiative excludes <laughs> you can't put wind turbines down there so that's out and you know that's that would have been prime other than it floods you know pretty much every other year now it's been flooding so that that's not good either when you're trying to run equipment out there so yeah it's always is a take you know there, there are some sustainable packaging stuff going on i can't speak you know, specifically but i know that from chats with our packaging means that there there are some things they're actively looking into and then the exterior molecule we've had around for a couple of years now, but we've really started to see a ramp up in production and ask from our customers. Um, so we're 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 happy with that because we're able to produce more of a product that is on that sustainable sustainable front. We've started getting more buy-in from customers on it. Yes. Are you are you able to recycle any offset materials, you know, the granular materials, that kind of thing, or are you allowed to do that for the regulations? Mm, mostly we, not, but it depends on what you're talking about. It offset. depends on what's in the process, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if it's pretty far up in the stream, then there's some other considerations you have to take into, you know, how might it process if we do run it through the rest of the plant? Is it going to stop up the equipment? Is it going to cause breakdowns or failures? Um, but like if it comes to say the final packaging and the material, we go through the testing and our quality control says, hey, this is outside of the specs that we want to allow release of to our customers based on the degradation profile of our product and shelf life. Um, we do have certain areas and criteria that we can reprocess that material and combine it with fresh to either get it to the correct dilution or, um, you know, different countries also have different requirements and specifications for being to hit. So sometimes you can actually convert that maybe off spec for one country, but you can do a couple small changes and now it's perfectly fine to be used in this other country because they use a slightly different application or a slightly different dose in comparison. So there's there's a lot of policies and procedures around that that are all guided by regulatory bodies and approved up through all those levels of uh, levels that are needed. So um, we don't like to do it. We try to get everything right first time as much as we can. Um, but we understand that there is a need to have some of that to lower not only lower the waste but also lower you know costs that the company keeps from the product perspective. If you're really early in the process, like still the fermentation stage. And it's a challenge to, I mean, anybody that's ever tried to do like home brewing, you know, if you get, get the wrong microorganism in there, you can ruin a batch, right? Which foreign growth for our, for us is pretty much will we'll kill a batch of, you know, a fermented, fermented product. So, but our solution to that is, again, land application, because you still have all the same nutrients in that that you're feeding that microorganism, but you can basically dump that whole batch you know, blend it with everything else we're land applying and, and get the nutrient value out of it that way. So it, it it's much better, like I said, than, than sending it out and either 
landfilling it or incinerating it. You know, so that's kind of our ultimate. That's the other other route we end up having to take. Yes. Hey, water well hits really mm -hmm. matter. Six. Point four. Yes. You said there any non hazardous waste still in? Oh. Yes. It's another one of those challenges that's, you know, always try to minimize, try to work on minimizing that as much as we can. Yeah. We do have some compactors on site too. Yeah. So well, so for cardboard or free crap and, and so at least lower the space consideration. So. Yeah. Even like auspic packaging, it gets all the way to the final, final, final. We end up having to repackage it and send it to a different country, that sort of thing. So those bags, one of those challenging mixed stream recycling opportunities because it's, what is it? Like paper, plastic paper. It's yeah, it's great. Area. Yeah, so most of our bags for keeping shelf life for water vapor transmission rate to prevent degradation or mold or whatever it may be, um, they're typically either three layers of craft paper and then a plastic layer or the same type of paper and then like a foil liner on the inside. On, on that end of the plant is typically how it goes. Yeah, it's it's difficult to find somebody that's going to take that for, for a recycle stream. You end up having to do a lot of manual, manual handling to get you know, recycle that type of material. So that, that'd be an example of one of our non hazardous waste that ends up going a lot. And a couple of them, one of the examples of sustainable packaging they looked into for a bit, it ended up not being feasible based on the interactions and kind of density of our molecules and what our process could run was creating beds for the customers that you could tear open and then you would get just the plastic piece out that you could recycle the paper on them. Um, but due to just you know, interactions and feedback and looking at how that might impact customers that of course it had to be bespoke. So even internally, if we could figure out a process for separating those layers, we're gonna probably still end up with part of that waste stream that ends up having to be disposed of destructively. Um, which isn't a problem if you're recycling paper. Even for us, though, there's like FDA and internal requirements around. We don't want somebody grabbing a hold of our packaging materials and counterfeiting our products. If it's got our, you know, our marks on the bag, batch numbers and everything, you know. So that's another one of those challenges. Yep. Yep. <laughs> right, I think we're back on schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have uh, slated for a 15 minute break that we can catch up on emails, texts, use other facilities, visit. If we're ready, we'll get started uh, with some um, um, item updates, regulatory updates. Yep. Uh, I am Carrie Clevenger, and I am the Small Business, business Regulatory Coordinator, and I'm a CFAT member. Um, I kind of briefly over my, over my um, work history in the last one, but I'm new to IDEM as of August and spent about 19 years with the National Guard and their environmental program before I came here. I remember that one too. So for the rule, the resources and rules and policy notices, obviously IDEM has public notices, a site that provides public access to all of our notices as required by statute of all Indiana. Uh, rules and regulations. 
So you can always access it there. Uh, we also have a news and events calendar that provides information on public meetings that do not require public, public notice. Uh, the Indiana uh, Register documents all the agency's public notice content. So you can read, always get those there as well. Uh, the rules in progress, and that's kind of some of the things we're going to be talking about that on uh, the rules update um, are also available on the, um, the rules making webpage. Uh, and then the Environmental Rules Board website has the dates of the meetings, um, the upcoming meetings, and um, summaries and agendas for what is presented. And as OAC TOP maintains a list of compliance due dates for Indiana businesses. So if you forget when things are, you can go to that page. You can also just get, get a hold of the CTAP program as well. So the last rule board meeting was last week on March 8th. Um, and there wasn't a lot of new things. Um, one of the, the ozone re de designation emergency rule was uh, act, put forth again because they're still working on the finalization. And that's that second one. And that just impacts the Clark, Boyd, Lake, and Porter counties for the redesignations. Um, the information should be uh, the final rule for that is supposed to be in June. Um, and so hopefully they'll finally get that set, put together. If not, the emergency rule will also be put forth in that June meeting. The safety clean SO2 revisions were preliminary adopted. Final adoption uh, should be uh, in, Ju in June. And then the solid waste definition was finalized. And I have a, a couple of slides, for, I have a slide for that one. So rules of interest, the solid waste definition is just updating the solid waste definition in the hazardous waste rules to make them comparable to the federal regulation. Uh, recently, uh, with some of the new hazardous waste on the federal side rules, I didn't kind of looked at all the rules and now they're just adopting them um, word for word uh, in the Indiana code. Um, so, are there any questions about that one? It will be effective. So it's been passed and it'll be effective in July of 2023. Okay. There's still some rules under development that you won't see on there, but have been uh, briefed before. So legitimate use is still in rule development. They have a committee working on getting those rules up to date. It's gonna be focusing on standards and criteria for procedures for determining legitimate use, proper storage handling, record keeping, um, circumstances which materials are not considered with legitimate use, such as speculative communication or, recycl or accumulation and scam recycling. Um, and that will just give you kind of the standard of, you know, how long can you store something before it falls into one of those categories. Um, standards for the denial of the legi legitimate use request. So, you know, so you guys know if you're putting it for a legitimate re use request, you'll know uh, what the standards are and if you will get a denial or not. Um, and then streamline the process for common legitimate use specific types of waste and materials, such as asphalt shingles, um, and then the financial assurance requirements as all the rules go through. Uh, that, I, there is no um, date for that to be set forth for the, uh, preliminary adoption. Um, so just keep looking for it. I think it's still a little bit of ways out. The rulemaking process does take time, um, but when that's available and it's, it'll be publicly, um, but on the public notice and you'll have time to review and comment as well. And making comments to the rules um, as you see them really helps make a stronger rule for industry. So if you are interested in these rules, the rules board meeting will give the updates of when what we're looking at and the public comment periods. And those are really important so that we can make better rules for you as well as for the state. The next rule that's still under development, it was, was slated to be presented at this rules board meeting, but got postponed. It should be presented in June of 2023. It's the um, use of combol or coal combustion residuals, um, examples for raw, raw material for manufacturing and other products, structural fill when combined with cement, sand, water, produce, produce and control strength fill material, road-based construction, um, so we still have to comply with the federal rule. That is a new rule that has come out recently, but uh, this is going to be Indiana's take on that. One of the programs that we wanted to highlight was uh, the Class B firefighting phone collection project. And that's just in partnership with IDEM and the Department of Homeland Security to collect firefighting phone from municipal and local fire departments, voluntary fire departments. 
House, of, House Enrolled Act 1189 restricts the use of Class B firefighting foam containing PFAS uh, for training purpose, purposes of training. So it can still technically be used for emergency fires because the uh, rollout of a replacement is kind of slow, um, but the use for training is prohibited. So those fire departments aren't even being able to use that material for training purposes. Uh, again, it is limited to the voluntary and municipal fire departments, and we've actually had some really good turnout. Uh, that'll be in the next slide, but this is just kind of the timeline. Uh, the, the proposal uh, started in 2020 with obligating funds for about $1.5 million. Uh, contractor was selected in 2022. We had some surveys to find out where we were going to pick that up at, and then the collection began in April of 2022. Um, there's still some sites that, that can still respond to the surveys, um, and we're still hoping to, to pull more in, but we've had, actually had a very successful program. Um, there's been about 226 locations that have responded to the survey, and they've actually picked up the uh, foam, and then we exceeded our expectations, and we've actually um, put for disposal 32,964 gallons, so that is actually a really big number. And this is one of the programs that we're really proud of that we've partnered with. And my favorite part of the presentation is touting our uh, IDMC TAP Compliance Assistance Program. So how many people in here have actually used the Compliance Assistance Program? A few of you? Okay. So as you know, we do have regional staff and we also have a centralized staff. We do have regional staff in our four different regions of Indiana and then centralized staff when you get the information, you call in to either the hotline, you email, or send a portal uh, notification in. It goes to, depending on where you're at in the region, it goes to one of these people. Um, one of the things that we did launch um, recently was the CTAP online portal. And that's really a good place for you to start if you have questions, sign up for the portal, get in the portal. And so you can be a contact, you can reach out electronically to us, you can actually do some um, kind of like sort of like instant chat, but sending comments back and forth so that we can help you. If you've got quick questions, we can do that as well. And it allows us to track where we're going, uh, places we've been to, um, and provide that assistance. It is confidential to use the portal. So if you have concerns with that, we are bound by the confidentiality and we are a free confidential service. So, you know, please use our services. If you do not, if you call or you send an email, you're still going to be put in the portal. We're going to ask you for all your contact information. This is a good mechanism for us to be able to track the amount of site visits and the amount of companies that we interact with to put our numbers forth that we still have a valuable program and that we can still serve you. Um, let's see. Again, the, the portal, this is just the items electronic resource page. We do have a button that will take you to the CTAP uh, portal. If you go electronically, then you will be asked to do an Access Indiana account. Most of us have Access Indiana associated with our BNBs or um, other services that Indiana um, puts forth, but you do have to have that account first. Um, and then you can set up your account on the CTAP portal. Again, when you do call or leave an email, and if you haven't already been put into our portal, we'll, we will do that for you. You will get some email notifications for that portal. They may go to spam. But again, that's a really the best way for us to communicate with you and track what we've done for you. You can also go back um, in the portal and look up other questions. Um, we, there's a document section if we need to share documents or you need to share documents with us, we can put those in there as well. And that's a good resource for you to go back and forth uh, with our office um, to make sure that you're getting the answers that you need. We have a couple of different ways that we can answer your question. Not every uh, question requires a site visit, although we really do enjoy doing site visits. They're the best way for us to help you if you have a specific question um, that we need to actually get our eyes on to help you in the best way. But <clears throat> we can also respond to you through the portal as well with some recommendations. We'll cite the regulation and give you our recommendations for what you guys can do um, to be whatever, whatever the question that you have answered is. Um, we also have a way that you may see this is to track the emails we send you. So if we send you, a, if you send us an email, we'll track those as well. So that you know, sometimes people change emails or or things like that, and they'll always be tracked in the system as well. Again, site visits. Please have us come out. It, it really does help us better suit you to get eyes on and, and be able to see what you guys have. Um, 
and, and give, a, give you the best part of our service. Uh, then we would like to note that our services are whatever we see at that time or the question that you ask. It does not supersede the program area. So if there's something very specific that the program area may be better suited for, we may direct you to answer to, to that program area to get the best result for your question. Um, again, everything that comes to us is free and confidential. However, sometimes to better serve you, we have to ask for you to waive confidentiality to, to work with the program area directly. We will only work with the program area on your behalf or work with them and with you waive confidentiality. But sometimes we get really better, better results for you as the clients. Um, if we can get that, we'll get you with the program area to get the answers that you need. So, and IDAM is here to, to make sure that we are working with companies and getting you in compliance. Um, part of CTAP is so that we can try to get to you before you have an inspection, before there's a violation. Um, so using us as a resource for things that you might need assistance for, that's what we're here for. And that's what we'd really like to be able to do. Um, I've always said for since I've started it, and I know my other uh, staff members are the same way, we love to be a proactive service instead of a reactive of we got an inspection and now what do we do? Or we were told we needed a permit. What do we need to do? Use us of, oh, I think I might need a permit. What, what do I need before you're in violation? So we do have some up, up, um, upcoming uh, IDEM E101 trainings. Um, we don't have some dates yet, but we're hopefully tentatively doing an E101 uh, in May for the hazardous waste management for generators. It's kind of a, an extension of the waste characterizations that we did um, last year. And then hopefully we will have the how to calculate your potential to emit um, in June. So those are two really good programs that we're gonna do. If you're not familiar with our E101 series, um, we used to do some of these trainings in person, COVID hit, and to be able to still be able to serve people, they went web-based. So one of the things we're doing is providing these 101 um, and sometimes 201 trainings uh, virtually. Um, but sometimes we get a little bit more participation um, and you guys drive what we present. So if there are suggestions or things that you think you want to see or questions, you know, if new rules are coming out and you want to know how the generator improvement rule, uh, you know, the, how that works, or um, there's being changes to the industrial stormwater permitting, we can bring in either our staff will put the, put the materials together or we'll bring in program staff to kind of get you that information. So let us know. CTAP um, email can work just fine for giving us suggestions. Um, but we do also, if you participate in these, or, or these webinars, we'll also have that as part of our survey as well. Any questions? We do have some from online. Uh, one asked, do you know if the class fee for the home program has been shared with local LEPCs? Uh, that is a great way to get it to local levels. Uh, I don't know for sure if it has, but we'll definitely pass that along to the, the phone collection uh, group. I, I'm sure that they've worked through that. I know that they the fire marshal sent out a lot to the local fire departments as well. And then just one other one. Uh, when will the slides be sent out? The slides you sent out. A couple days. Okay. Okay. First, first of next week. Yep. And all the links are active, and you can reach that. And again, you can reach out to me directly. Um, my specific focus is small business, but I'm a part of the CTAP group, so we we're here to help you guys in any way we can. I think I will get this ready for our next presenter. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> And my coworker Jacob is here to talk about waste. There we go. Thanks. Yep. All right. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Jacob Smicker, and I oversee the Indiana eCycle program for the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. Uh, so, today, so today, I just kind of want to give a little background on the program for folks that might not know a whole lot about uh, the program itself. Also, want to kind of talk about some of the stakeholders uh, that kind of make up the program. And then also kind of want to talk about some of the data associated with those stakeholders. And then also, I want to talk about some of the uh, collection events uh, we've done not only in the past, but some of the collection events we're doing in the future 
and maybe also um, see if uh, there could be like a partnership opportunity there with uh, all you folks. So with that being said, I'll just kind of dive right into uh, <coughs> my presentation here. So uh, the Indiana eCycle program, it was established back in 2009. And the main focus of the program is to reduce electronic waste that's being sent to Indiana landfills. Um, it's also uh, the programs there to ensure that the material um, is being collected and recycled in a responsible manner. And then um, it's also a really a uh, huge pro uh, focus with the program to promote the uh, recovery of valuable materials that are found inside of electronic devices. Um, so like your aluminum, tin, copper, uh, those sort of things. Um, the program, uh, we promote uh, the program um, through education and outreach to citizens. So we really try to educate folks across the state of uh, what you can recycle, where you can recycle those materials and so forth. And then we also do a lot of um, promotion in other ways um, through the form of maybe grants, um, not through the e-cycle program itself, but the state uh, specifically within IDEM offers many grant opportunities. Uh, for example, like the Recycling Market Development Program um, just recently gave away some grants. Um, one of them being to ERI, which is a larger recycling facility in Plainfield, Indiana, to purchase a battery shake uh, mechanism to better help um, recycle batteries. Um, also, some fire safety equipment they got with that grant. Um, so, and then also another facility that just recently got a grant is Cascade Management, um, also located near Indianapolis. Um, they got a shredder for television. So. Those are just some of the ways we try to promote the program, um, both at the citizen um, level and then also uh, with businesses, uh, companies that are actually recycling the material. Um, did want to talk about some of the stakeholders that make up the program. Uh, the first one being uh, what we call manufacturers that operate within the Indiana eCycle program. And when I say uh, manufacturers in relation to the program. That's going to be like your Apples, your Dells, Sony's, Microsoft, Google. Um, they participate in the program. Um, they submit like a registration to the program. They submit an annual report, but probably one of the main things they do is they have a recycling obligation that they have to fulfill with the state. And that recycling obligation is based on the units of uh, electronic devices that they actually sell um, to citizens. So um, that's the manufacturers that uh, participate in the program. We also have collectors that participate in the program, and the collectors are simply the folks that are actually collecting the material. Um, so that might be like your solid waste management districts. Uh, Goodwill is actually a collector that operates within the program. Um, they collect a tremendous amount of electronics that just can't be resold. Um, so they're a participant. Also like Best Buy, Staples, uh, those sort of facilities actually collect quite a bit of e-waste. And then you have the recyclers. Um, recyclers are just the folks that are actually recycling the material. So I mentioned like ERI over in Plainfield, they have a pretty big facility over there. Um, also you have a facility like Technology Recyclers. These are pretty neat operations. Um, they have pretty large grinders there at their facility um, that literally kind of takes like light batches of material, e-waste material, like printers and uh, scanners and so forth, and actually shreds them all up and uh, sends them on to conveyor belt. And they have a whole bunch of different magnets and eddy currents kind of going through to extract the different metals and so forth. So those are uh, kind of the three stakeholders that make up the Indiana eCycle program. And then I also want to point out before we kind of get into uh, some of the upcoming slides that has some of the data, uh, the program itself really uh, focuses on this kind of tailored listing of devices. So um, in program terminology, these are called covered electronic devices. Um, so in the upcoming slides, when um, I'm talking about what was collected, what was recycled, recycled um, this is what I'm talking about, these specific devices. And um, really, the reason there is this kind of tailored listing of devices, because again, when I'm talking about the manufacturers that participate in the program, they have those recycling obligations. These are kind of the uh, kind of listing of materials that those folks kind of produce and sell to uh, citizens. So um, that's kind of the uh, listing that we're looking at. So diving into some of the results, and these are results from 2021, um, our deadline for point. Point two data uh, just recently passed, and we just haven't been able to 
sift through all that data. But um, for this past year, or for 2021, I should say, uh, we've had 67 manufacturers registered with the program. And then for 2020, they collectively had a recycling obligation of just a little bit over 22 million pounds. And then for um, 2022, they had a 21 million pound recycling obligation. And the way they fill this recycling obligation is they work with a collector that's registered with the Indiana eCycle program. And then they also work with a recycler um, that's also res registered with the program to have that material recycled on their behalf. So this is kind of a quick snapshot of the number of uh, folks that uh, register with the program from a manufacturer standpoint, what their recycling obligations kind of look like. Um, so jumping into some of the collector results, uh, for 2021, we had uh, 84 collectors register with the program. Uh, they reported collecting 28.5 million pounds of covered electronic devices. And then I wanted to highlight, um, just so you can see the difference between what's collected from metropolitan areas compared to non-metro. Um, we had 25.2 million pounds collected from those metropolitan mm -hmm. areas and uh, right at 3.3 million pounds collected from uh, non-metropolitan areas. And metropolitan area, in terms of the program, is just going to be a larger county. So like your Lake County, Denver County, uh, those sort of counties. And non-metro is just a smaller county. So jump into the uh, recycler results. Uh, we had 26 recyclers uh, register with the program. So again, that's going to be like technology recyclers that I mentioned or ERI and playing field. Uh, we had 26 of them. Um, they re reported recycling uh, just a hair over 31 million pounds of material. And then I always like to point out since the inception of the program, uh, we've had uh, over 350 million pounds of uh, covered electronic devices being reported as being recycled and not obviously a direct result of the program, but we definitely like to think that the program's helped out to educate folks on where to take their electronics and then also through some of our grant mechanisms to help promote recycling in the state of Indiana. So that's the uh, results. Um, and I mentioned at the very beginning, just wanted to talk about some of the collection events we recently uh, did, and then maybe also talk about how yeah. Uh, we can maybe do a partnership down the road, but uh, recently, the first one I'll highlight is we always do an annual collection event at the government center, um, and that's always well received um, from uh, in state employees. Uh, that event, we collected just roughly uh, 15,000 pounds of electronics, and I should mention most of that uh, collect, most of that number is actually just folks walking up stuff. Um, so that was an event we did, um, but the event I kind of want to highlight is actually kind of we, I'll call it a pilot program we did. We did an event down in Seymour, Indiana, in which we funded, we entirely funded the event through item through the program. Um, and we worked with some really great partners down in that area. Um, one of them being Cummins, who's a P2 partner. They're really great. They had uh, terrific volunteers that helped out and also provided an excellent location for that event. And then uh, we worked with technology recyclers and then also Jackson County uh, Solid Waste Management District, which is located down there. And they're really great um, just with their footprint and to help us with education purposes and getting the word out. Um, but I want to highlight just, you know, the amount of material we were actually able to collect um, at the event and the number of vehicles. You know, we had, you know, 380 vehicles came through that um, line and then collected right at 900 uh, right around 900 TVs and CRT monitors. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of see a picture of the, a picture of the event. And then we collected right at 63,000 pounds of e-waste material during this event. And this was just a Saturday event. Um, and it was just a three hour long event. So we were able to really collect a, a tremendous amount of material uh, at this event. And again, as I mentioned, this was kind of a pilot program and we just wanted to see if this would be worthwhile to do something like this. and. I think the numbers uh, kind of speak for themselves. Um, so with that, we decided to kind of take a look at doing future events, um, something very similar to what we did in Seymour, Indiana. Um, we kind of have just some rough criteria of some of the things we're looking at um, uh, for the event. We're kind of looking at doing two events like this uh, each calendar year will be entirely funded uh, by item. 
Um, and some of the kind of criteria we're looking at as far as where to actually host an event like this would be a county that doesn't really have great um, electronic voice services. So really no collection points or uh, very limited uh, options for actually taking those devices and sure and uh, also looking at like disadvantaged communities, so kind of low MHI, medium household income areas. Um, also looking uh, maybe if there's adequate partners, P2 partners in the area, but I should mention that it's definitely something that is not a definite, but um, uh, to actually be located in the area with um, something we're looking for. But as far as kind of the actual location, uh, like the physical location for the event, we're looking at places that kind of have like large parking lots, because um, we kind of do like a drive-through snake around kind of approach, um, and then also a location that's definitely not on a busy roadway. Um, but we have identified um, at least two uh, possible locations, first one being we're looking to do an event in Sullivan County uh, around you know, late July 2023 timeframe. So just a couple of counties down below us here. Um, and then we'd love to do a, an event in Stark County uh, up in kind of northern Indiana, north central Indiana, maybe around the time, the time frame of October 2023. Um, but would definitely love any kind of partnership or uh, so forth from P2 folks. Um, but just kind of wanted to give her a brief overview of the eCycle program um, and then kind of just talk about some of the things we're doing with it and, and some partnership opportunities with it. Uh, but that's really kind of all I had uh, for today. I don't know if anybody has any questions about electronic waste or what we're looking to do. Yeah, Jean. So um, your event in Seymour, when you think of Seymour, it's a relatively small community. So how far did folks come to, you know, um, drop off their TVs and stuff. And yeah, so definitely there. folks, uh, obviously uh, the surrounding counties, uh, we definitely saw folks come from there. We did track that data um, just where they were from, uh, but primarily Jackson County. And then also we did have the surrounding counties because we didn't have any stipulations saying you couldn't bring stuff uh, uh, if you were not from Jackson County. We didn't, and we didn't charge any money, um, so that was why it was so successful. We didn't charge for televisions or anything like that. Um, so. Did you have, uh, did IDEM pretty much fund all of the marketing? Um, yeah, yeah, we funded but, pretty much everything. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. What did you put on the matter of the marketing? Like, how did you get the word out? Mm -hmm. So we did a, quite a few different things. We worked with the media department within IDEM, uh, took like a boots on the ground approach as well. So I actually went to Lake Seymour and, and that community and just kind of went around talking to businesses, getting the word out, went to the police station, fire department, schools, all the different departments associated with a, a town. Um, I emailed, I can't tell you how many people I emailed. I just literally Google searched and just pulled emails off uh, all the different organizations I could, whether that was the schools, uh, please, I mean, all the departments. So definitely got the word out that way, contacted <clears throat> the radio stations, newspaper outlets, all that sort of stuff. Um, just really anything, any email I could pull or uh, mechanism um, I tried to do. And I think it worked. I think the word really got out um, with that. So. No, we didn't limit it at all, actually. Um, we didn't limit it, limit it to just Jackson County residents. We didn't, didn't limit it at all. So you come from anywhere. Yeah. Um, when you do determine the dates, I think we'd love to be able to put those on some of the partners, um, social media yeah. and help uh, communicate that too. Yeah, yeah, and we're actively working on securing like the exact date, but like mm -hmm. I said, the event um, in Sullivan County, we're kind of looking at late July mm -hmm. 2023, and possibly the event up in Stark County in October 2023, sometime around that, but um, yeah, and we're definitely, would love any folks that would like to partner with us to do an event like that. Like I said, Cummins partnered with us, and um, it was fantastic. Um, 
And yeah, we just got a ton of material. And I should mention too, the weather wasn't great that day. So uh, we, we still collected a uh, tremendous amount of material. And that's why we want to do it. You know, we saw there was a huge need for something like that. And uh, we definitely want to continue on and continue to do events just like that. So when you partner with a company to host this, who is responsible for getting that material disposition? Uh, it's, so we sent it out for bid to like a recycling company. So we sent it out across the state to different folks that, um, that that's their business. So a couple of examples would be like DRI. Um, I know I've mentioned them a couple of times. Uh, they're a very reputable company. They have the R2 certifications and all that sort of stuff. Technology Recyclers is another great company um, that I know uh, usually bids on projects like that. Um, so it's it's on the the recycler themselves, and they're the ones that provide all the transportation, so all the box trucks, semis, and that sort of thing. We have that language in the bid um, as well, and they they're the ones that provide the staff um, uh, to actually handle the material and, and so forth. Um, volunteers, we really like to just see them kind of directing traffic, handing out things to citizens. We usually like to. You know, give them a few um, educational items about the recycle program, maybe about like we did it in Jackson County about their solid waste district and try to get the word out of what they can do too um, and just educate folks. Uh, but yeah. We have a few online questions too. One is uh, Do you have any lessons learned from items you could not accept uh, that day? Oh. Uh, we defeated Jacob. Oh, I think any lessons learned from right. items not to accept. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I, I don't personally, I know um, one of the reasons some of these companies are really great to work with is because of just their mechanisms that are in place. Um, so like a technology recyclers or like an ERI, they can really handle all kinds of materials, uh, whether that's a toaster, a laptop. Um, so they kind of have an array of items that they can they can work with just because of the way their shredding mechanisms work. Obviously, batteries are always an issue um, or can be an issue um, these days, especially with fires and so forth. So understanding how to properly handle them. Um, okay. And then just one other, uh, not related specifically to e-waste, but tox away days seem to be successful. The only problem I see in Southern Indiana is uh, it usually only happens in Vanderburg County, and you have to be a resident to use it. Are these in partnership with item? If so, it would be beneficial to have other counties participate. I have employees ask me how to be, dispose of stuff they have at home frequently. Yeah, no, I know a little bit about the three days that occur. Um, I know that one in Bartholomew County is usually a really successful one. And a lot of times that is at the local level. So usually it's funded by the county, the solid waste district. Usually they have funding set aside uh, to do an event like that. And um, yeah, a lot of times that those events will accept electronics, uh, and all kinds of hazardous substances, even tires a lot of times at those events. Um, uh, that's kind of what I know about those and what I can speak on. So can, oh. can I help with that question? Yeah, so um, at our company, we um, helped, we just Googled the counties and most counties um, in the state have a page where they say how to provide yard waste, household goods, and a number of the things you mentioned in addition to just the e-waste. Um, so that might be a recommendation to, to Google and they have current almost all the counties had current, you know, in 2023 uh, when we were looking earlier this year. Yeah, yeah that's definitely a good suggestion. Uh, I would definitely point out whatever county it is to try to see if they have a solid waste district and to see, if, you know, they have an events page um, to locate when they, when they might have an event like that. And that's it from online. Okay, thank you. That's all. Yeah, well, I Piggybacking on that, your values and your numbers that you showed up there, they did not include like electronics brought in or possibly days by the counties. Uh, that would uh, typically, those that data should be included in that. Or typically is reported through the solid waste district or whatever their vendor is that they're working with with their electronics. So I know, for example, like at the Bartholomew County and Toxway Day. You know, they do all kinds of stuff, whether that be tires or hazardous waste and yeah. whatnot, but then they also do electronics and their vendor, which is technology recyclers, 
uh, they're the ones that actually report all the e waste data and they report that into the recycle program. Oh, okay. Do the, do the recyclers report back to you on what they actually extract from electronic waste? Or uh, they don't waste? break it down to like, I, mean, I think, you know, from copper, aluminum, and steel, and all that sort of stuff. I don't get, I just kind of get the raw number. Mm -hmm. um, so but I assume those are all based on income and pounds, you know, TV or Siri or whatever. And then what do they get out of that is probably a fairly small amount. But yeah, it's all like based on income. Like things like that. But I just wonder if they, if they report that one where that is. No, not not into the e-cycle program. It is just based on the whole path, the whole device, basically. And I have one more. Do you guys have the ability to go out and inspect the collection sites? People that have set up collection sites for you for yeah, space? yeah. So I it's kind of what I one of the things I do is I do get around the community not only to educate, you know, and and also uh, educate on proper or best management practices from a collection standpoint. Um, I also go with uh, through the Department of Land through IDEM. I go a lot of times with their inspector, and we go to different facilities that are kind of collecting e waste kind of on a larger scale. So they have different criteria uh, that they have to fulfill um, and, and different requirements. So uh, yeah. I do get out and try to try to in, in inspect locations. And then if I ever come across uh, different locations that I don't recognize, you know, I, I uh, work with my colleague in land and we try to get out there and, and, and do a site visit essentially. So you gotta have like covered storage. Yeah, we look for that. Storage, we don't want it just kind of sitting out and that sort of thing. So there are different requirements. Um, it's actually more related to the e waste rule, um, which is managed uh, through land. But uh, yeah, there's different requirements like that um, that has to be properly stored and, and so forth. So. Yeah, but we definitely try to get out and um, educate folks on um, things. Yeah, is there any other questions before I? I was just going to add yeah. one thing. I feel like you're underselling how huge that Seymour event was. I was there that it's day. It's remarkable. With the I of mean, yeah. we were unloading vehicles for oh, yeah, three and a half hours. And we built the line. Semis and you couldn't even was, see the yeah. end of the line of vehicles in Seymour. And that's exactly why, yeah, we want to continue it. I know Pat Daniel, our section chief for recycling programs, and Mark Amnick, the Southeast Regional Office Director for IDEM, were both really surprised at the turnout. And even the Solid Waste Management District was like, where's all this stuff coming from? <laughs> I mean, people were definitely like clearing out barns. I mean, TV, old TVs that were older than me were coming out of the woodwork from people's barns covered in bird crap <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was it was a lot of material and, right right yeah. we were not charging we're paying yeah. technology recyclers or whoever our vendor is and that was kind of the point cost. uh yeah. so they don't end up where you don't want them basically so that's why we did do it for free um so it uh, didn't you know, with televisions, especially because there is always a charge with television. Uh, yeah, Jacob did a really good job working with all of our partners down there to get the word out because they definitely knew about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what I'd like to say is I just, I, you know, I mean, Jacob underestimates his abilities to have gotten the word out. I mean, that yeah. is absolutely amazing because it really is a relatively small community. And to get the sense of how much actually filed in and from where everybody was coming and to actually make that event happen in three hours in a, on a bad day, in a bad weather day, yeah. um, you know, there's, it, it opens up a lot of horizons for some of the other areas of Indiana that are a little bit more rural mm -hmm. uh, events, you know, oftentimes, you know, folks don't know what to do with those things and it's just hard to say TV's in the backyard, whatever, and stuff. So, um, yeah, if anybody that's a partner um, or knows folks or wants to partner with um, Jacob for future uh, locations for e e recycling, um, I think it's a, a, an excellent benefit for Indiana's environment. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, Jacob. thanks.
All right, the last presentation before lunch, <laughs> and cannibalizingly, it's already spread out behind us as we speak. So I promise I'll be on time or uh, maybe even a little bit early. Thank you, Carrie, for setting up my slides. I don't have that many slides. Um, I'm Missy Shaber, the Clean Community Program Manager. And without even having to get into the slides, I can tell you in a nutshell what the Clean Community, thank you, enter, obviously, what the Clean Community Program is. Basically, clean community is to municipalities, governments, cities, towns, counties, what partners for pollution prevention is to businesses and facilities. So if you want to think of it just kind of as a sister program, as a matter of fact, I'll even have people email me, maybe from a business saying, I'd like to be a clean community program member. And it's like, oh, let me steer you to G because that's more partners for pollution prevention. So if you can just kind of categorize it in your mind like that, that gives you an idea of what the clean community program is. For one thing, similar to partners, it's voluntary. Um, I used to be an inspector for stormwater. I used to go onto a site and it was not voluntary to deal with me. So it's fun <laughs> now when I go to a community and I'm there because they want me to be there and I'm there to enjoy them and enjoy all their awesome projects. So I get to play with the good players now, much like all of you in this room. So it's voluntary. There's no fee to participate. Again, much like partners. Right now we're working with six pilot communities. We are revamping the CLEAN program, which I'll tell you a little bit about in the coming slides. It used to be way too cumbersome. It used to have an EMS requirement. It too closely followed the business model. And municipalities, especially small municipalities, they, that's just way over their head. It's too much. Mm -hmm. So we are really simplifying the CLEAN community program. And right now, the six pilots have been really patient with us because that's what a pilot is. It's trial and error. We're finding out what is and is not working. So we're about ready to launch the program statewide. We've been saying that it seems like forever, but it will be coming in the next um, couple months for sure. And then the program will be open to any municipality within the entire state. And incidentally, that's what I hope you take back with you today. All of us in here in this room represent a county, a city, a town. I'm assuming that not everyone happens to be from here locally. So I hope you can go back to your municipality. And if you have any connections with any government leaders or even just as a citizen, say, hey, I heard of this great program. Um, would you be interested? So I'm hoping you'll go back to your respective municipalities and spread the word. The revamp, first of all, we changed the name. It used to be called the Clean Community Challenge. Well, think of being a vacuum cleaner salesman. Who wants to go to a municipal door and say, I'd like to give you a challenge? <laughs> um, it just, it was a turnoff, I thought. So we changed the program to Clean Community Program. That way when people are digesting what it involves, they're not immediately um, set on their heels and like, oh, this is gonna be really cumbersome. I don't wanna do this. We updated the logo, which I'll show you here in just a minute. And we're focusing, much like the projects that were referenced here today by Elenco, we're focusing on sustainability now. The old clean program used to just focus on their systems, like maybe their wastewater treatment plant, their drinking water system, if they had one. Well, now the sky's really the limit as to what projects can be done. We're focusing, I mean, you can still do those systemic things, but we're also focusing overall on sustainability. There's a project list with descriptions. If I get a new community that is clueless, has no idea where to start, we actually have a nice little list of, hey, here's some project titles. Here's a description of how to do it. You're all set. Um, we're also being innovative. I've had some pilots say, hey, those are nice, but we're doing this project and it's not on your list. Okay, submit that to me. Um, we'll review it and we'll make it a clean project if it matches our review. So we're actually letting communities be innovative and make up their own projects as well. And then that can be a project that another clean community could choose in the future. And again, we've streamlined those reporting and paperwork requirements. That is our new logo. The reason that's important is that the municipalities love to be able to put that on their letterhead, on their websites. Um, if they attain gold level, which I'll go through the levels here in a minute, we actually will offer some street signage to them. So there are different perks and rewards that they get for being a member of the program. And that recognition, that logo is really important to them. We solicited feedback from the pilot communities. Hey, what do you want the logo to look like? And we wanted to give them a part in that. And that's what mutually we and they came up with. 
It's a three-tiered membership. So we try to incorporate equity into the program in several ways. One way that we do that is we allow communities to work at their own pace. It's not expected that a municipality with very few resources and small staff would be able to do the things that Fishers or Richmond or Indianapolis could do. So you can enter at the bronze level, work at your own pace. At the bronze level, we just require that initial commitment, um, obviously, of joining the program, creating a clean team. We want that clean team to be representative of all kind of uh, different departments within the municipality. Um, I have clean team leaders from stormwater departments, parks and rec, solid waste. It can really be headed up by anybody within a community, but we want the whole community, the, the municipality within the government to have a representative, preferably from several departments within that community so that they're all working together. And we do have an annual meeting that we let them attend and that's an awesome networking opportunity. They get to compare projects and meet each other sometimes for the first time in person. Silver level is where the project requirements come in. Four, six, or eight is the number of the projects, and that's based on community on population size. So for under 35,000, you would only have to do four projects. 600,000 is the cutoff on the upper end. Really only Indianapolis reaches that. So for the most part, all of my pilots right now are either in the four or six project category. They're either small or medium communities. But Indianapolis, if they choose to join in the future, they would be one of those eight project requirements. And again, they can do that at their own pace. There's no hurry. Um, you know, of course, we encourage forward progress and I check in with them frequently, but we want them to be comfortable and, and do it at their own pace and not feel rushed. That was another feedback issue that we got from the revamp is they're going to drop out of the program if they feel like there's some really strict timelines. So we want to give them that flexibility. Is and then I'm taxing um, year. It doesn't have to be per year. That's the awesome thing about it. It can be those projects, maybe it takes them two or three years to complete, and then they can choose to stop at that and stay a silver member, or they can say, hey, we've got more projects that we're working on. Let's take another couple years and we want to do four more, six more, eight more, and we want to be gold. So it doesn't even have to be per year. Project requirements, again, we've discussed the equity, equity that we've tried to build into that. Some examples of the project categories, it's not limited to these, but I just put a few on the slide. We've talked about several of these today that again are applicable in the business world as well. Waste management reduction, energy renewables, um, community resiliency, that last one. We have some assistance with Indiana University. They have an environmental resilience institute. And they help us with some of the projects like greenhouse gas inventories, climate action plans. And speaking of the one year requirement, those are monstrous projects to tackle. So there's really, sometimes you can do a climate action plan in a year, but typically it's an 18 month commitment. So if they choose those big projects on the list, we want to give them plenty of time. Some project examples, we've already talked about tops away days. They can actually do a Soul Smart Community. That's an independent program to item, but we will accept that as a project for Clean Community, for example, if they've completed that. Community Gardens, uh, Tree City USA is another program that's common. There are a lot of different projects they can pick. That's just a few that I decided to put off slide. And again, they can make their own and create a new project title. Tell me about it. I submit it to my management and then it becomes another project. So the communities are really excited about being able to be innovative and do their own projects as well. And it's all about working together. That's the fun part of my job. When I go to a community and I see the interdepartmental relations and one did a community garden and then over here they've got stormwater ordinances they're working on and to see them come together as a community and then work with us, IDEM, it makes a really good partnership to showcase some really innovative things. Clean at idem.in.gov. That will point to my email address. So if you want to contact me, um, I either have some business cards on me, of course, or you can just remember clean at idem.in.gov. That will reach my inbox 
and I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. I would love to have some referrals from you for different municipalities that want to come on board as a clean member. The application used to be, I think, six pages, <laughs> and as part of the revamp, I condensed it to two. <clears throat> so it's a much simpler application, especially since COVID. People just do not want to mess with something if it's tedious. I walked into a municipality the other day to promote the clean program, and the first thing she said, I mentioned just briefly the application, the paperwork. She said, oh, you didn't tell me there was paperwork. Like, oh my gosh, I've lost her already. But it's just two pages. So there has to be some reporting, obviously, for us to manage the program, but we really do want to keep this simple. Do you have any questions? Yes. What is the pilot communities? We have Zionsville, Merrillville, Richmond, Fishers, Brown County, and Beach Grove. Those are the six. And it's awesome because I can email them and say, well, like with the logo, it's like, yeah, what do you think about this? And oh my gosh, the fee. I mean, they really did care. <laughs> they actually had opinions like, oh, that's too busy or this looks too childish. We're going to put this on our public roadway. We don't want something that looks cartoonish or kiddish. And like, oh, I didn't think of it that way. So we modified it a little bit. So the pilots have been awesome. They've been really patient with us and um, changing things midstream and saying, oh, we were going to do it this way. Just kidding. And then they'll have to shift gears with us. And so pilots have been great, but I really look forward to rolling it out statewide. Any other questions? When do you anticipate it would be rolled out statewide? I'm thinking it would be the end of April at the earliest. What I want to focus on first is my pilots, many of them are ready to be graduated up to the silver level. And they're submitting projects to me for review, both my administrative review, and then I like to go field truth those. And I really would hate to roll out the program statewide while my Pilots are still waiting, like, wait a minute, we've been with you for two years, give us our silver status already. So I'm trying to focus on the on the pilots and graduating them up to the next tier before rolling it out statewide, but it's coming very soon. Yes. Do you have plans for recognition such that, uh, you know, I think about uh, friendly competition amongst the communities? That does, that absolutely does happen. And we issue, we have a letter that we send out when they attain silver status, when they attain um, becoming a new member in the first place. There's some press releases that go out with that. There are social media posts, Facebook, um, I believe even LinkedIn we can do. So it absolutely is a competition factor when they find out what a neighboring community is doing. Like, oh, well, we've done something similar. Let's, you know, we can do that too, or we can improve upon that. So our press releases, social media, that's where they get a lot of their recognition. And that means a lot to them. One of the perks of the program that brings up a good thing I didn't cover is they get advanced notice of inspections if they want that. Um, sometimes it's meaningful to them like, hey, we're a clean community. We wanna take advantage of that advanced notice so we know an IDEM inspector is coming. But I found that even more meaningful to them is the recognition, the, the media coverage and the public recognition. Oh, we're right on time. We can have one more question. On one of your initial slides, you said that in order to be a community in there, you had to have a, a, a good environmental. Yeah. What is that entail? What are you looking for there with going to a community? We utilize a couple mechanisms for that. When I have a community that wants to join, we would actually have a CTAP, the CTAP program that Carrie spoke about. Our CTAP staff can go in and look at their facilities, look at their compliance history administratively through our database and say, okay, these are issues they've had in the past, but they're now resolved or no, they've got a little bit more work to do before they're back in good standing with us. So we do do an environmental history compliance check. It's on the community itself and not maybe the industry. That's an excellent point. Yes, if you've got, let's say an example of a bad player within a community who's had, there's a, I won't say where it is, but there's a community that's had PCB issues in the past with a major automotive manufacturer. That in no way would withhold that county or that city from becoming a clean member. That's an excellent distinction, not at all. It's strictly based on their municipal operations. Good questions. Anybody have anything else? Thank you for going forth and promoting clean wherever you work or live. And I'd love to have some referrals from you. If you have any questions, you just snag me later on. Would partners or ESP members be able to partner with the clean community for like outreach, uh, like we did outreach and that type of thing that they could then use as 
one of their projects or extension for their report. Absolutely. Report. That's even when uh, John with Elenco was speaking earlier, I asked if the recycling was open to the public and I was kind of trying to make that segue <clears throat> because it would be very possible for, it, it turns out in that case, the city or county is not really involved with the recycling directly It's something they pay for. But it brings up a, a good example that if a business is doing something that could easily partner and qualify as a clean project, then yes, they could actually communicate with that municipality and say, we as a partners or ESP member, are doing this project, would you like to help us? It can count towards your clean project. It can count for us for ESP partners. We would highly encourage that partnership, absolutely. Anybody have anything else? Awesome, well, thank you and enjoy lunch. It's great. <laughs> So lunch in the back, I know there's about a half of people that had some dietary restrictions. So if that's the case,